Sunday morning service, the 11th of July. It seems, I think we are past the halfway mark of the year, and yes, it truly is cold. Um, we have the heater on here, just to keep my legs warm <laughs> during <laughs> the service, um, but it is cold. I trust that you are tucked in nice and warm at home, but still free enough to worship God this morning. I think in uh, the 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 memory verse for this morning, or the verse for this morning, is very much in alignment with the, this morning's message. But we've been talking about God's promises, and, and this, the theme of the series is the God who makes and keeps promises, and how God is able to do so much more than we can ask or imagine, how God is truly faithful to His promises and true to His Word. And so the Word comes from Mark chapter 9, and it talks about the boy who has had this um, spirit and would cause him to convulse and throw him in the fire and all sorts of things. And so Jesus, in verse 21, asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or in water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And listen to what Jesus says. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Verse 26, the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. I want to encourage you this morning that if there seems to be something that is impossible or seemingly impossible in your life, that you would Confess your belief in Jesus Christ, the one who is able to do more than what we ask or imagine. If you are going through trials, if you are going through difficulties, if you are, are facing struggles, even though it might be one after the other after the other, I want to encourage you with this word, that you would confess your unbelief where you have been fearful, where you have, have doubted that God is able to do it. And that you would change that unbelief into belief. And that you would say, as that father said, I believe that you are able. I want to encourage you with that word today. Let's quickly run through the announcements for this morning and for the week ahead. We are still closed um, for all in-house services, whether it be our connect groups or our Sunday morning services for the entire month of July um, we will be closed. We will, however, still be online for these services. For those of you who would like to join our Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday evenings, please make contact with us via the WhatsApp button on Facebook or contacting us, and we will link you to that um, meeting on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Then please do continue to pray for um, those, our families in need, as well as our church planters uh, in the bulletin. Um, please do keep praying for them. It is obviously a difficult time of the year for them uh, uh, as pastors who've planted churches and their members aren't able to come. Um, and that's their only source of income. So let's please pray for our church planters and all our churches. Then we have two birthdays this week. On Tuesday, the 13th of July, we have Nazila Sassman, 
We pray a special blessing over your life, Nazila. And on Friday, the 16th of July, uh, we want to pray a special blessing on Sandra Quantoy, who will be celebrating her birthday. May God bless you both on your special days. Um, it's been a quiet week. There's only the two birthdays, no anniversaries, but we pray God's special blessing on them. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer as we ask God's blessing over those celebrating their birthdays this week, but also as we pray God's blessing on our time together this morning as we have come together to praise and worship Him and to receive from Him. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we are so grateful that we can be in Your presence again this morning. Even though we find ourselves in different venues, not all together in the church building, yet we, the church, are still gathering together, even though it's online. And this morning we pray your blessing, we pray your anointing over us as a church. Father God, I pray that you would come and touch every single home, that uh, the lives represented this morning in in our online services, Father God, that they and their households will be blessed. Lord, I pray that your word would go out this morning as a double-edged sword to, to come and encourage, to convict, to transform hearts and lives. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, truly minister to our hearts this morning. Also, even our time of worship, Father God, we pray that you would prepare the soil of our hearts. And Lord, that ultimately we would remember that this is all about you. So as we praise and worship you, Father God, may you be our center focus this morning. That all our praise and worship would be a sacrifice offered up to you. So now, Father God, won't you bless us? Won't you make your face to shine upon us? And won't you be gracious unto us? Lord, I pray that our time together would be blessed, would be anointed, and it would be so evident that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is among us this morning. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Won't you bless Sandra and Azilla on their birthdays? Won't you, Father God, give them good health? Won't you provide for their every need and cause them to be a blessing to those around them? And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It's amazing Who am I that you are mindful of me That you hear me When I call And is it true that you are thinking of me to me. 
Lies, but he brought me his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. And I'm a child of God, yes, I. a slave for sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I'm chosen, and I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. Not against me, I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the 
chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am, Lord. And I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. Not against me, I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. to remind you this morning that you are a child of God and that he you are who he says you are uh, David says in Psalm 27 even though my mother and my father reject me Lord God I will praise you I will worship you God sees you this morning God is concerned for you this morning God loves you this morning and be reminded by these truths that we are who God says we are not the world not our circumstance, not our situation, but we are who God says we are. We are children of the Most High. And God is faithful this morning. God will meet you right where you are if you would just surrender to Him and experience the love of God this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Thy great faith. 
to be darkness without you I live my life in blindness but now I found you and I'll see to me in kindness and now I live and I'll sing I'll sing I love you so and I'll sing
so grateful this morning Lord Jesus that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God God even COVID cannot separate us from your love of God even though we are not able to meet together as the body of Christ it cannot separate us from your love I pray this morning Lord Jesus that we are reminded that regardless of what we are going through you still love us because you sent your son even while we were still sinners to demonstrate your love towards us height depth the year and now the future there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord I pray this morning Lord God that we will live and walk in that love that we will love you Lord God in response with all our mind with all our strength with all our body with all our soul that we would love our neighbor as we love ourselves I pray this morning Lord Jesus that you would have your way in each and every heart, each and every life, each and every family represented this morning, Lord God, each person that has taken out the time to meet with you, I pray that you would meet them right where they are. I pray this morning that you would use our pastor as a mouthpiece to speak into the hearts and lives of each individual and remind them, Lord God, that you have a plan and a purpose for their life, that you are still in control, that if we, Lord God, lose our lives for your sake, we will find it. I pray this morning, Lord Jesus, that you have your way. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you, Tyron, and um, I suppose myself for leading us in worship. Um, we're hoping to get the worship team uh, back by next week if we are allowed to. Um, but yes, it's it's been good to have more of a, even just a time of almost like an acoustic set of just 
being so few, but just worshiping God, seeing the, the goodness of God, even in the midst of that, even though we are missing our, our full team, you know, God is still here. God is still moving. God is still ministering to us and through us um, in this time of worship. So as I mentioned early on, we are still on the series, The God Who Makes and Keeps Promises. And we are on the second part of the series. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned last week, there are seven parts within the series. And this uh, second part is titled Witnessing to the Promises. That is experiencing the promises, seeing it firsthand. Um, and I'm sure we all can say that we have experienced the goodness of God firsthand. Now, this morning's message, as I suppose this entire, entire series, is very personal to me because, you know, um, I'm experiencing this firsthand, um, seeing God's hand at work within my life. And so it's been very personal to me as I've prepared these messages. Now, I must say that I do not doubt God's ability to keep the promises he's made. I do not doubt for one moment God's ability to keep the promises he's made. Promises that he's made in general to all believers. But more specifically, promises that he's made to me personally. And now you might think, did God have a personal conversation with you sometime that we aren't aware of? But let me tell you, if you read scripture, you'll find plenty of verses where promises are made to the individual. If you read God's word, you'll find plenty of verses that ministers to the me, to the individual person, where God speaks a word into our hearts and lives. Now, to an outsider looking into the story of my life, they might ask whether I'm seeing someone for my delusional thinking. How can you say you believe in the promises of God and yet you are going through so many issues yourself? How can you say you believe in the promises of God? Now I've been asked, and this is, this is a true story. This has happened on, on more than one occasion. This is what I've been asked. Why is it that you are sick? when you're serving God as a pastor? I've been asked that question. Now, I've been asked the second question as well. Why is God not blessing you with the things that we have? We have our own home. We have nice cars. Our kids have all the gadgets that you can think of. We are able to go away every month. Why don't you have these things? And the third one, shouldn't you be more blessed than us? This was something that somebody actually asked me shouldn't you be more blessed than us seeing that you follow god the way you do well i must be honest sometimes in the moment of weakness i think about some of these things too but very quickly i'm snapped out of my funk is what i wrote on friday don't ask me why but that's how i felt i'm snapped out of my funk and once again i realize how blessed i am and now at moments when I feel uh, weak, I encourage myself that Paul had a thorn in his flesh. But sometimes it feels as if I fell into the thorn bush. Those long white thorny pins that you find in the Karoo areas. In fact, Bernie and I drove past one yesterday in Durbanville and I said to her, that tree is going to be in my sermon tomorrow. Those long white needles. Sometimes it feels like I've been tucked in one of those bushes. If I am very honest with you this morning, most of our church knows um, a bit of, of what I'm enduring, what I'm going through. And some of you have heard over the last couple of weeks as I've shared very briefly in, in my sermons how God has come through for me. But if I have to share with you 
honestly how I'm feeling right now. Um, yeah, I'm not in a good space. <laughs> I, for those of you who don't know, I've got an autoimmune disease. And it goes into remission for months at a time, sometimes even for a year at a time. And at other times it flares up, and this year seems to be probably one of the worst that I've experienced so far. As I'm standing here at the moment, I might sound like I am lisping, but it's because my mouth is completely inflamed. My cheeks, my tongue is full of ulcers. My gut is a mess. My joints are a mess. My heel is sore. My knees are sore. I'm just not feeling myself this morning. And so that's why I said in the opening that this series is quite personal to me because it's reminding me once again about the God that I serve. So again, you might ask, how can I believe that God keeps the promises he makes? Especially feeling the way that I do. And the answer is quite simple. And that's the title of this morning's message. The answer is quite simple. It's them stones. In the next few verses, we are going to read about the 12 memorial stones and the important role they play in our lives, but also the lives of the generation to come. The key word for the mo this morning's message, once again, is the word remembrance. We've been looking at that word over and over again, week after week, and it is so important that, that we remember who we are. And these 12 stones stand as a remembrance for the nation to remind them of what God has done. Listen to these words written by James Huey, one of my favorite songs. And it says this, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord how he picked me up, turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. You see, when I think about the Lord, when I remember what he has done for me, then I am able to carry on. That is why them stones are so important. Joshua 4, Joshua 4 verse 1 to 9 reads as follows. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had groomed, Oh, sorry, the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites. As the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the twelve stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan, at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. Father God, won't you bless the reading of your word to us this morning. May you use me as your mouthpiece, Father God. 
No matter how I'm feeling right now, Lord, I commit myself to you. I'm simply your vessel. So this morning, use me as you see fit. I pray, Lord, that your word would go out to bless us and encourage us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you are saying amen at home. The first thing I want to say and look at this morning are stones that speak. The purpose of the stones is to remind and teach the whole nation, generation after generation, concerning the marvelous deeds of God. Now remember, God had just led them through the Jordan. Joshua speaks to the tribes and tells them, go back and pick up the 12 stones where the priests are standing and bring them back to the side where we will stay this evening. And so there are three things that stand out to me about these stones that speak. Now you might say, how do stones speak? Well, they speak a volume because of what they are symbolizing to the people and to us. Firstly, the memory of God's goodness is honoring to God himself. What was the first thing that was happening that evening when those 12 stones were placed? You see, God's goodness to us should cause us to have a continual attitude of worship as we praise and glorify God. Can you imagine you have just come through this Jordan? You have gone through, uh, can I say, a lifetime of difficulties? Remember, this is now not the main, the first generation that had left Egypt. Some of them had left and stayed and died and moved on. And so this generation went through this whole 40-year experience in the wilderness. They had seen the hardships. They had seen the difficulties. They had seen the goodness of God. They had just come through the Jordan on dry land. Their feet were dry. Suppose there were a little bit of sand between their toes, but that's nothing if you think what they have gone through. But in response to God's goodness, as they place those 12 stones, you'll see that they worship. They have this attitude of worship. They praise and glorify God because of what God has done. So the memory of God's goodness should lead us to have this attitude of praise and worship at all times. Secondly, the memory of God's goodness is an encouragement to holiness. We see what God has done for us. You see, remembrance feed, feeds the flame of devotion. Remembrance feeds the flame of the devotion, feeds the flame of love and of trust. To think about God's goodness is profitable to our spiritual life. It's conducive to fellowship with God and to true happiness and contentment. You see, when we remember what God has done for us, firstly we praise Him, we glorify Him, we worship Him, but also in the same sense we think about our own lives and we realize that because of what God has done for me, I need to step up. I need to respond by following Him wholeheartedly. You see, my heart, my life needs to be in the right place. The memory of God's goodness should spur me on to holiness. And thirdly, the memory of God's goodness is an encouragement in time of trial, danger, and fear. The distressed and troubled may well call to mind the divine interventions of the past, which will lead them to exclaim these words, The Lord has been mindful of us. He will help us. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will help us. You see, when we remember what God has done, as we look at these stones that speak, we are firstly called to praise and worship Him because of His goodness. 
Secondly, you are reminded that because of what God has done, it should cause me to live a holy life that is pleasing and honoring to God. And thirdly, when I face a challenge, I can simply remember those stones. I can simply look at those stones and remember what they represent. They represent that God has been faithful in the past. Surely he will continue to be faithful. Surely the God who has brought me through the previous trial, the previous difficult situation, surely he will be faithful to do it again. So I have learned that no matter what I'm going through, God is still good. No matter what I'm going through, God is still good and He deserves to be praised no matter what I am currently experiencing. Now, I went for some tests this week. We've come back to that stage where the medication um, that they have for me that doesn't work. There's nothing else they can give me right now and so I need to go on a trial. And so I went for various tests to see if I qualify for this trial. And while I was sitting there with this needle in my arm and the nurse was taking vial after vial after vial of blood, I think she took all in all eight vials of blood, a thought came to mind. As I was sitting there and as she was trying to distract me, I think she was trying to distract herself because she doesn't like needles. A nurse that doesn't like needles, but okay. A thought came to mind and I said, look at all of that blood. Look at all that blood. That blood represents life. That blood represents life. No matter how I'm feeling now or the fact that I need to go through these trials or the fact that I need to go through all of these tests and screening and all of these things, I still have life running through my veins. I am alive. I am blessed. I can still be used for God's glory. You see, no matter what I'm going through, there is blood, there is life running through my veins. And here I stand this morning, God using me. Is God good? Amen. Yes. All the time. Can I honestly say that? Yes, I can. This last couple of weeks have also caused me to check my life, to check my attitude, to check my thoughts, my desires, in my relationship with God. You see, the memory of God's goodness has caused me to check my heart. Am I walking with Christ as I should be? Am I growing? Am I desiring more? You see, in this moment of sitting at that table with all of these uh, um, vials of blood being taken, I firstly realized how good God is. And then in the midst of the storm, I can still praise Him. I also realized that I need to check my heart and check my life. Because life is precious. Days are numbered. I don't know when God is going to call me home. Where is God going to find me? You see, I need to check my heart at all times if I remember what he has done. Now let me tell you something else. The memory of God's goodness is the only thing that has kept me going. The memory of God's goodness is the only thing that has kept me going. The fact that God has blessed me with a beautiful wife who has helped me, who has carried me, who has loved me unconditionally during this time. The fact that God has blessed me with a daughter who came at the perfect time as the most precious gift and has been our little light for the last eight years, the fact that God has placed me within a loving family 
who cares for me, who nurtures me, the fact that God has placed me in a loving church family and caring support of friends encourages me in so many different ways that I can only praise God and continue to walk this journey with a renewed sense of hope. You see, when I remember what God has done for me personally, I have to praise Him because He's been faithful. When I see what God has done for me personally, I need to realize, I need to check my life because He has paid a price for me. He has saved me. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to hang on that cross for me. I need to check my heart to make sure that I am in the right place. I do not want to waste that gift, that precious gift. And thirdly, when I remember God's goodness, it reminds me that the God who has been faithful to me from day one is the same God who will carry me till the very end. I met with my specialist in the week with quite some frustration. And as he opened my file, he, he said to me, do you realize that we've been here since 2008? That's when I was diagnosed initially. He said, do you realize that, that every six months we've had to change medication because for some reason it doesn't last longer than that? He said, do you also realize that last year, exactly this time, it was the 2nd of July, he wanted to put me on the trial, but I didn't qualify for it because he found that I had fatty liver disease and my ALT was 150. And he phoned me to say that this time my ALT was sitting on 20, which he said it's only a miracle that it would jump from such a huge number to where it is today. And again, I was reminded that the God who has carried me from 2008 in the midst of the challenges, is the same God who has been faithful and will continue to be faithful. I know I'm sharing a lot about myself this morning, but I said this is a very personal message to me. This is a very personal series to me because I can see how God is at work. I can see how the stones speak in my life because God has been faithful. And I want to share this with you so that you can also see the goodness of God in your own personal life. Here's the thing. I know I can face any and every trial because I can remember God's goodness to me throughout my life. I can face any and every trial don't now come and make life difficult for me next week, please, just to test it. But I want to say I can face any and every trial because I can remember God's goodness to me throughout my life. And you see, we need to share God's goodness with those around us and the generations to follow. You see, those 12 stones spoke immediately of God's goodness. Immediately those who were around there, the 40,000 who was ready to go to war, the rest of the families and those who were in that area, immediately saw what those 12 stones represented. But verse 9 says, and they are there to this day. What does that mean? That means that they continue to speak to this day. You see, God's goodness to us, as we remember God's faithfulness to us, should speak to me in the year and now for what I'm facing now. But it should also speak to the generations to come. As we share of God's goodness, as we tell our children what God has done, as we tell our colleagues, as we tell the world, this is what my God has done for me. This is what those 12 stones represent in my life. 
God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God's mercy, God's unconditional love. You see, those 12 stones need to speak. How are our children going to know about God and His goodness if we do not tell them the stories of God and how He has worked in our lives? How is our community going to know about God and His goodness if we do not tell them the stories of God and how He has worked in our lives? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Verse 10 to 14 reads as follows. Now the priests who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, ready for battle, in front, of all, in front of the Israelites, as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they stood in awe of Moses. Firstly, we spoke about stones that speak as we remember what God has done. Secondly, there needs to be a response to that. And that I want to say is that there needs to be feet that obey. Stones that speak of the goodness of God and feet that obey. The value of instructions is in the doing of them not just in the knowing of them. Let me repeat that. The value of instructions is in the doing of them, not just in the knowing of them. It is one thing to know the way, another to walk in it. You see, the priests remained in the Jordan, and that represents God's presence is both providing and protecting the way. Remember, as their feet touched the water, so the water parted. Providing the way. And as they got to the center, as the people crossed over on Joshua's instruction, they remained there, protecting the way. You see, the presence of God makes a way. The presence of God protects the way so that we can get through on the journey that God has called us to. The people hurried over, doing the instruction, not just knowing the instruction. And then we see also in the description in these verses that all the tribes played their part. You see, it is important for us to be a part of the doing. You see, these people followed the instruction exactly as it was given to them by Joshua, or by God through Joshua. You see, sometimes we see God going ahead. We see the waters part. We get to the edge of the water and we, we take that step back. Whether it might be fear, whether it might be stubbornness, whether it might just be that we are hard-hearted, hard, hard-koppig, what's that, hard-headed, whatever. But sometimes we get to the edge of the water and, and we turn back. We, we don't want to go this route. We don't want to face this journey. What happens if the water decides halfway that it's going to come back? What happens if God doesn't come through on his promises all the way to the end? But you see, as the priests remained standing in the presence, as God's presence was there, we realize that God provides the way and he also protects the way. So if God has given you a word, if God has given you a promise, if God has said he will never leave you or forsake you, if God has, has spoken a word to you personally, God will provide the way and God will protect the way. 
And look at the people. Joshua gives them an instruction as soon as the, the, the priests and the Ark of the Covenant reads a certain, certain place, you ought to walk over, you need to follow, and once they settle in the middle, you are to go past and go to the other side. You see, the people followed the instruction, instruction to the T. They didn't just know the instruction that was spoken. They didn't just know the instructions that Moses had given them. They didn't just know the law that was written on the tablets found in the Ark of the Covenant. They actually obeyed. They actually followed the instructions that were given to them. And this is an important part. And they mention the names of the tribes. And you see that all the tribes played their part. Everybody in the congregation, if I can call them that, played their part. You see, they became a powerful nation because everybody played their part. They defeated Jericho, and you can see that in the next couple of chapters, because every single one played their part. You see, it is so sad seeing believers who know the word of God, who know the difference between right and wrong, who know what they should be doing, where they should be going, how much they should be giving and supporting, yet they cannot bring themselves to do the things that God has instructed them to do. It is so sad to see that people make up so many different excuses why they cannot do the things expected of them as believers. Yeah, I'm going to say it. <laughs> you might not like me, but I'm going to say it. I believe that a lot of what is going on in our communities is because we have not been faithful in teaching and living the word of God. Let me repeat that again. I believe that a lot of what is going on in our communities, in our homes, is because we have not been faithful in teaching and living the word of God. Now you might say that is your job, Pastor. You must teach the word of God. Yeah, I do that on a Sunday. Yeah, I do that at our meetings. But I'm not in your home every day. I don't have the opportunity to speak to your children every day. I don't have the opportunity to speak to your colleagues every day, to speak to your family members every day. But you have that opportunity. What does it say in Deuteronomy? Is it Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4? Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 onwards says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, soul, and strength. And it says, teach these things to your children. Impress them on their hearts. Put them on your, on your hands. Tie them around your neck. Put them on your doorpost and the entrance and your gates. Make sure that everybody knows what you believe, what you stand for, is what they are saying. Teach it and live it. You see, that is our responsibility as believers. Our households need to reflect that I have been teaching as the father of the house, I have been teaching in the word of God and living the word of God. As the mother of the house, it needs to reflect that I am teaching and living the word of God. You see, I believe that so much can change and will change when we as the believers, the children of God, are truly living and teaching the word of God as we should. We have become weak in our faith. And it has become even more evident in the next generation. We have become weak in our faith and it has become more evident in this new generation because they are looking at us. I'm going to say another thing that you might not like. The church is dying. I'm not speaking specifically about OBC, 
But the church, the universal church, is dying. Why is it dying? Because its individuals are no longer living. The church is dying because its individuals are no longer living. You see, the word of God needs to go out. The remembrance of what God has done needs to be put into action with feet of obedience as we go out and follow the instructions we find in Scripture. Let me conclude before I get in too much trouble with you all. <laughs> Are we truly walking in obedience to God's word as we should? Are we following his word as we should? Are we honoring the commitment that we made to him and also to our church family? Are we honoring that commitment as the tribes did? Remember the first instruction came from Moses. Joshua called out, I think it was in last week or in chapter 1, the end of chapter 1. He spoke a word over them and reminded them what Moses said. And they turned around and said, we will follow you. Whatever you say, we will do. Wherever you go, we will go. Just as we committed to follow Moses, we will follow the instructions that you have given us. You see, they were committed to the word that God had spoken. Not Moses or Joshua. They were committed to God. They were committed to do what God said they need to do. Are we honoring the commitment that we have made to God and to our church family? Let me ask you a few more questions. When last have you told somebody about Jesus? When last have you pointed somebody to those 12 stones? When last have you told somebody about the goodness of God? When last have you told somebody to look at those 12 stones in remembrance of God's goodness. I was recently asked, why, are they not, why aren't there any young people in our church? You know, we've got a few children. We've got one or two teenagers. We've got no young adults. Well, unless you count me, I'm still a young adult. We've got very few of them, and we've got senior people. But why is there no growth happening in our church? And I responded to them by taking them back to our constitution. You know, if you go to the printed word, you can't go wrong, and you have to blame the people that came before because they wrote it. But let me remind you of some stones that you had personally witnessed and agreed to. And now, as much as this is for members, this is for all believers. This speaks to all believers. This is what it says, and this is what every single member has agreed to. It says this, each individual member has the responsibility and the right to participate fully in the church's life and government. Every member, we like to work to look at the word right. I've got the right to be involved and to, be, um, to have a say. But you have a responsibility to be participating fully in the church's life. Every member shall be entitled and expected to exercise his voice for the welfare of the whole church in a spirit of prayer and love. This is what I want to focus on, this. Members, every member shall be expected to support and maintain the fellowship of the church by prayer. How many people will be at our prayer meeting? Eight. That's 
My maths isn't good, but I don't think that's a very good percentage. By attendance at services whenever possible. By engaging in some specific service. By conscientious giving as God's provision enabled. And listen to this one. And by introducing strangers to the church. By introducing unbelievers. By introducing people. Don't go and steal from another church and bring them here. We don't want that. By introducing unbelievers to the church. So that we will have an opportunity to minister to them. Now let me ask the question. When last have we fully participated in the life of our church as we should? And I know there are certain restrictions on us at the moment, but these responsibilities carry a lot more weight than just Sunday morning attendance. Church, this is an indictment on all of us, and I include myself. We are responsible to point people to see and remember the goodness of God. We are responsible to share the gospel message and to disciple people in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage every single one of us to not just remember what God has done, but that that remembrance would cause us to step up in obedience to God's word. You see, these extracts from our constitution and from our membership agreements, they are all found in the word of God and based in the word of God. This is what every single believer should be doing. We should be encouraging. We should be bringing people to Christ. We should be discipling. We should be supporting. We should be gathering together as the saints in fellowship and in worship. Those are all things that you will find in God's word. And so we should be doing all these things. And we should not take them lightly. If we are honest with ourselves, and I think the numbers will tell if we look at the amount of visitors that walk in our door i believe it is quite evident that we are not inviting people to the church we are not inviting people to christ we are not inviting them to experience god's goodness we are not talking about jesus as we should church we are guilty church we need to step up and this message is not for numbers sake. I don't want to see the church grow overnight with a whole bunch of numbers and simply that is what we are planning and hoping to do with this message. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that we need to become obedient to God's word. We need to be encouragers. We need to be people who follow God's word, who teaches God's word, who lives God's word. This morning, I want to remind you of them stones. And that we would keep our eyes focused on God at all times. To remember what he has done. To remember his goodness. And to obey. To have feet of obedience. That we would walk in and live in the promises and the presence of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer before we approach the communion table. Father God, you truly have been so faithful to us. You truly have been so good to us. Lord, how can we not remember your goodness? How can we not see your faithfulness if we just turn around and look at our history? Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Father God, in response to your message, I pray that we would become obedient. Obedient to your word. Obedient to your calling over our lives. Obedient to your promises that you've made us. That we would live in them and not walk in fear. Not walk in doubt, 
but we would take those steps knowing that you will see us through. Father God, I pray that your word went out this morning and that it went out with your power, with the power of the Holy Spirit to come and touch our hearts as a church. That this church from this day onwards and every person who has heard or will hear this word Lord, that we would step up in obedience and that we will never be the same again. That we would be transformed by your word, that we would grow in depth and in, in faith, Father God. That we would love your word above all else and that we would live it. And now as we approach the communion table, we want to say thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross, giving us this opportunity to be sons and daughters of God. May this, as we remember it, not all be wasted. May we truly live out Jesus Christ. May people see him alive and active in our, our thoughts, our desires, our actions, our thinking, our teaching. May Jesus be evident in all things. And now as we partake together of the bread and of the cup, we pray your blessing on us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took up the bread, and as he had broken it, he said, This is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same way after supper, Jesus held up the cup saying, this is my blood poured out for you. This is a new covenant made between us. Take it and drink it in remembrance of me. For as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you, in your faithfulness, you went all the way, took all our sin and shame upon your shoulders. How you died on that cross, and you were buried in that tomb. But praise God, three days later, he rose again. Praise God that on Ascension Day you returned to your Father. Praise God on Pentecost Day reminded that the Holy Spirit was given to everyone who believed. Because of that, we have life. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, we know who we are in Christ. We have life, life in abundance. Let us not take that for granted. Let us not take you for granted. As we look at your presence, as we look at those 12 stones in remembrance of what you have done, May we respond with the right heart, with the right attitude, as we honor you in obedience. 
Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. And I pray a blessing over us now. Amen. This morning I won't pronounce the benediction over you as a congregation, but we're going to sing that beautiful song, The Blessing. Won't you join me this morning as we sing that blessing and as we pray that blessing over ourselves, over our families and over our children. And we ask that God would truly make those words come alive in us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. May God bless you. Amen. favor be upon you 
and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he's for you he's for you may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you he's with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he's for you he's for you he's for you he's for you you and your family this coming week. Amen.